Greetings, citizen. Hey you, hey you beautiful, creepy little human being you. Welcome to my channel and welcome to today's morbid makeup video. I'm so happy that we can meet like this. I'm so happy that somehow in all of this craziness, you and I today were able to find each other on this crazy little planet that we call home. My name is Brittany or Brad or scene, whichever you prefer. And today we're going to be discussing the murder of Irene Garza and boy, get ready to be mad. Okay, so this girl, Irene Garza, 25 years old, goes to her church to give confession and is murdered by her priest, okay? And then, does he get arrested? No, no, he does not. He gets away with it for nearly 60 years. And how did this happen? Because of a potential church and law enforcement cover-up. Yeah. But before we get started, if you have not yet had the pleasure, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out a new Morbid Makeup video every single week, and I would love it if you would come and hang out and join us and become one of us. One of us. One of us. One of us. And now that we're done with that pesky but totally necessary self-promotion, let's get into the story. And man, this one really sent me. <laughs> I had no idea what I was in for when I chose this case from my list. This case is one that was recommended to me by a subscriber named Priscilla. Hi, Priscilla. Hope you're doing well. Hope college is going well. Anyways, I had no idea this was such an intense case and I am mad. I am mad that she was murdered. I'm mad about the aftermath and I'm mad that it took me this long in my life to know about her. I'm just mad. I, this, this beautiful woman was murdered for no reason and then everyone that she trusted in authority failed her. The church that she loved and visited constantly failed her. And it's just very upsetting and disheartening. And honestly, it makes me want to slap somebody. But let me just cool my jets and tell you what has got me so heated. So come. Gather around and let me tell you the story of the murder of 25-year-old Irene Garza. Irene Garza was born November 15th, 1934, making her a Scorpio. She was one of two daughters born to parents Nicholas and Josephina in McAllen, Texas, and this is where she lived her entire life. Growing up initially, Irene and her family lived in like the poorer part of McAllen, Texas. And from what I've read, it seemed to be a pretty racially divided place at the time. I even read that there was a uh, public swimming pool in McAllen and any Latina human being was prohibited from using it. And the kids were instead forced to swim in irrigation canals. Irene's family owned a dry cleaning business and it started out small, but it ended up actually doing extremely well. And Irene and her family were actually able to up and move to the north side of McAllen, which was, let's say, primarily white. It was considered the nicer area to live. And her and her family picked up and moved on over. They were going up, moving up in the world, moving to a nicer area. They were doing well financially and they wanted to live in a better area. Like, like one does. I don't know. I don't know what I was trying to say there. I'm just kind of annoyed by the whole situation. I just, our past is really, really um, disappointing. <laughs> Before graduating from McAllen High School, which was again, a predominantly white high school, um, Irene, little, little Latina Irene had actually become the very first Latina baton twirler for the high school marching band. And she got to like walk in the front. She was the leader of the marching band. And this was a big deal because prior to that, it had only been white kids and she was the first Latina to do it. So this was like a big accomplishment for her. And it was something that in reading about her was, was noted often. Irene was very accomplished in all of her extracurricular activities. And she actually ended up being crowned as Miss All South Texas Sweetheart in 1958 and was homecoming queen at Pan American College. And if that wasn't good enough, she was also the first person in her family to even attend and graduate college. So she didn't only go and attend and graduate, but she was also freaking homecoming queen. Like she was killing it. I'm sure her family was very proud of her. All of Irene's accomplishments in her life, though seeming maybe average to someone now, were big deals at the time, just because of how racially divided the area was. From what I was reading, it seemed like in that area of McAllen, Texas, Anyone who's Latina was treated as a second class citizen. And it's so frustrating to read about because I'm glad that we've come at least we could do better. I'm not even going to say that we're good. We're better, but we could be a lot better with, with people. And reading about how we used to be is very frustrating. Like we have such a dark history in America and it's incredibly frustrating to read about, but it seemed that because Irene was very pretty and very fair skinned. She easily passed and people were more accepting of her in the area. 
And in addition to being like pretty and fair skinned, she was also well educated. She went to college and to high school, so people were pretty accepting of her and liked her in the area. As an adult, after graduating college, Irene decided that she wanted to work with children, which in itself is just like a commendable choice, because I don't know if you've been around children, but like that's not a job for everyone. And she ended up landing a job as a second grade teacher. As a second grade teacher, Irene actually decided that she wanted to teach um, poor and impoverished children from the south side of McAllen, the area that she had grown up. I'm not sure if maybe she saw herself in these children or if she just wanted to, you know, she's like, I was from there. These kids were me. I want to make sure that they have the best existence possible and the most caring and understanding teacher. So she ended up getting a job teaching these children and she ended up putting her first paycheck into getting these kids school supplies. And for some kids, she even got them clothes and shoes. Even though Irene was beautiful and popular and she had even been, you know, a beauty pageant winner. So she was used to being in front of crowds and being in front of people. When it came to one-on-one -on -one interaction, she was really, really a shy girl. But in the last year of her life, she was noticing that she was kind of coming out of her shell. She had been given the role of the secretary in her parent teacher association. And she was just feeling more confident, more comfortable in her position. She was loving her job and she took a great, she had a great sense of joy from what she did. She was one of those people who actually like liked her job. This felt like her calling and she was feeling like she was finding herself in the world and becoming the best version of herself. She was 25, you know, this is when that starts to happen. Like, in my opinion, you start to kind of get it together. You're past the, uh, the teenage years and you're kind of like in the adult age and you're kind of figuring out who it is that you're going to be when you're an adult, like an adult, a full fledged member of the world, old person. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like you really get there when you're 30, but I feel like you start going in that direction around 25. In letters from Irene to a friend that I read, it seemed that in 1960, the year that she would inevitably be killed, she was happier than she had been in a really long time. She had made a bunch of friends in the area and at her new job. She was dating a couple men. One of them she described as like a little bit more fun, but the other one was like cute and also religious. And this was very important to Irene because she was a heavily religious Catholic woman. She loved God. She loved church. She went to church, I believe twice a week, at least. She'd go once on Saturday for confession and then again on Sunday for Sunday morning mass. And she would sometimes go for confession and then stay for midnight mass. Like she was really in it. She was in the church life. She felt that her faith was stronger than it had ever been. And from that strength, it was bringing her happiness and making her feel courageous. And she just felt very centered in her life and filled with happiness. And she attributed this to her faith and the church that she went to. In 1960, Irene still lived at home with her family. And one evening, Irene borrowed the family car and said that she was heading to her church, the Sacred Heart Catholic Church, McGallan, Texas, to do confession on the Saturday before Easter Sunday, April 16th, 1960. She promised to her mother that she would not be long, but she left that day and was never seen alive again. When Irene didn't show up back at home in the evening, her parents just sort of assumed that she decided after confession to stay for the midnight mass, which prior to this case, I didn't even know that that was a thing. Midnight mass, that seems wild. But they assumed that she had just kind of decided, you know, I'm going to stay and I'm going to do some more churching. And this sense of like normalcy was dissolved quickly for her parents when 3 a.m. rolled around and she still wasn't home. So they started to go into a panic. Irene was reported missing during the early morning hours of April 17th, 1960. And Irene's parents decided that they should go into the church and talk to the priest who took her last confession to kind of see if she said anything, where she was headed, the kind of mindset she was in. So they head to the church and they talk to this priest. And this was a young man, a 27 year old priest named John Fight. They asked him like, did you, did she say anything? Did her frame of mind seem weird? Did she seem off? Was she upset by the confession? And he couldn't think of anything that would explain why she had disappeared. Of course, Irene's parents and authorities were hoping that she had just, you know, run off, needed to cool her head, that there was some reasonable explanation for where she was. But unfortunately, their faith and their positive outlook on the case started to diminish a little bit when evidence and items belonging to Irene started to show up along a long stretch of McAllen Road. It looked like somebody had been driving down the McAllen Road and was just throwing items of Irene's out of their car window willy nilly like and of these items included Irene's purse, her left shoe and a lace veil. And when these items were shown to Irene's parents, they confirmed that these did belong to her. And these were the items that she had worn to church during her last confession. 
Almost a hundred officers searched the area near the road where Irene's items had been found, some on horseback, they even had divers searching the irrigation canals. They were doing everything they could to try to find this missing girl, and this ended up being one of the most extensive searches in the history of the area at the time. Police were canvassing, they were going door to door, they were asking everyone in the area if they had seen anything, if they had heard anything, but everything was coming back as a no. This case was seriously so frustrating, it, it had to have been just impossible for investigators and for Irene's family, because with notoriety in a case, because this was a very popular case in the area, just because of how beautiful she was, and you know, that, that always makes for a more interesting story, doesn't it? But with the notoriety came the false leads and the weird looky-loos who just wanted to involve themselves in something that was not their business. In one instance, some dickhead lady actually called Irene's parents at home and claimed to be Irene and said that she was kidnapped and being held in like a hotel somewhere. And in another instant, there was a man who was like at a bar or a restaurant and he told his waitress like, I'm the one who killed Irene. And if you don't watch out, you're next. And which who does that? Fucking weirdos do. And police followed these leads though. They were like, okay, let's look into this. And everything came up as just a dead end. Just people who were just being dicks, trying to involve themselves in something that was no, had nothing to do with them. And it's so frustrating when people do things like this. Cause can you imagine being someone who loved her, you know, like you're so stressed out. And then you have these people who just like, don't give a shit, have no consideration for the fact that this is somebody you love. And they just, I don't know. It makes me really sad. I can't imagine what it was like for her family In following the leads up though. And finding, you know, that they were nothing. They had just a ton of questions and no real answers about, you know, what happened to Irene, where Irene was. Sadly, all the questions surrounding Irene's disappearance, were answered on April 21st, 1960, when somebody called into police saying that there was a body floating in an irrigation canal. And if you don't know what an irrigation canal is, it's like a man-made waterway that transports water from like the source of the water to farms in the area to, you know, help with crops and shit. This body was Irene. Irene's body was found submerged in water. She had been raped, beaten in the face with a hard and heavy object and suffocated to death. Any evidence that would have been on her body was washed away by the canal waters. They weren't able to recover anything. And Irene was found fully dressed, except for she was missing her shoes and her underwear. With Irene's body, they actually found a really weird piece of evidence that never uh, gets completely explained, which drives me crazy. And it was a photo slide viewer, which is kind of like, you know, I had to Google this. because I was like, um, a what? And you know, okay, do you remember those things from when you were a kid? It was like glasses and you put them on and you do this, different pictures go. Well, it was sort of like that technology, but it was sort of handheld, it looks like. Um, and it was just a way to look at photos, to view photos. It was an adult version of our, it wasn't really anything like that. I'm going to put a photo so you will see, but um, that's essentially the, the science behind it was similar to that little guy. So police thinking this was a really weird thing to find with a body, put a picture in the newspaper and we were like, Hey, do you know who this belongs to? Do you know what this is to try to draw out some more leads? Police questioned hundreds of people all across Texas about Irene's murder, including known sex offenders, Irene's own family members, coworkers, ex-boyfriends, all of them. They gave several polygraph tests, none of which yielded any useful information and authorities ended up offering up a $2,500 reward for any information about her death, which was larger than any amount of money that had ever been offered previously in the area for any other murder case. And in addition to that 2,500, there was also a group of like we wealthy businessmen who put their money together and offered an additional $10,000. That's $12,500 for any information regarding Irene's murder. And we're talking about 1960s money here. So that's a lot that holds more weight than, than it would now. There were many rumors about Irene's death circulating around the community. And one of these rumors that was of particular interest was that the priest who had last seen Irene was responsible for her murder, but police didn't actually think this was just a rumor. The main suspect for Irene's murder was none other than the priest who had heard her last confession, Father John Fite. At the time he was 27 years old and he had been at the church ever since completing his seminary training, which I think that means that this was essentially his very first gig. When questioning people at the church about, you know, the murder, the day of the murder, the night of the murder, the last time they had seen Irene, they found that 
John Fite's confession line was moving particularly slow that evening, and he had been away from the sanctuary, or like the, the church, several times, much more than normal. I think they said it was like he, he left six times in the 24 hours that he was there. Priests who worked at the church, do they work? Priests who, yeah, priests who worked at the church um, alongside Fite said that they had noticed that he had had fresh scratch marks on his hands when they saw him for midnight mask midnight mass the night Irene was murdered. And another thing that was of particular interest that they found quite odd was that Father Fight was said to have taken Irene to give confession in the church rectory, which I'd had to do a quick Google search. And apparently this is like the living quarters that priests would stay in. This wasn't like the main place where confessions would be taken. This was more of like a personal living space. So it was very odd and a bit um, inappropriate for a young priest to take a, you know, a young, beautiful woman to give her confession in the privacy of his own, like, living space. And the fellow priests of the church agreed. They said that that was uncommon. That was not, like, how things were done. You were to give, you were to take confessions in the sanctuary, not take them back to your, like, apartment to hang out privately. The fact that John Fight was the last person to see Irene alive was not the only thing that made him seem super suspicious to authorities. Well, you remember how I said that they found that photo slide viewer with her body and then they put it in the newspaper trying to figure out where, who it belonged to? Well, Father John Fight reached out to police and was like, yo, that's mine. He didn't explain how it ended up with the dead body of a girl who he took confession from and then was never seen again. He was, didn't explain that. So police ended up giving him some polygraph tests. And apparently initially it was said, like it was reported um, in the papers that he passed the polygraph test, but it was later determined that it was inconclusive. And later still they talked to the guy who actually took the polygraph test and he gave a totally different account, but we're gonna get there towards the end. So when, when questioned, John Fight, of course, denied killing Irene. He even denied taking her confession at all. But when he was pressed on this and was like, yo, we know, we like know you took her confession. He's like, okay, fine, you got me. I did, but I didn't take her back to the rectory. And then once they were like, well, we know you took her back to the rectory. He was like, fine, I did that too. And apparently this wasn't the only time that John Fight had tried to take Irene back to his rectory. Apparently, according to some of her friends who they interviewed later, John had tried to do this several times, saying that Irene was just too good to give confession in the plain old sanctuary. Okay, but anyway, he said to police the last time he saw Irene was at 7.15 the night that she disappeared. And police were like, okay, sure, whatever, sounds legit. How come you kept leaving the church that night? Like, everyone said that you were, like, gone. And he was like, okay, here's what had happened. I was taking confessions, chilling, not killing and I was fiddling with my glasses and I broke them. So I had to go back and get new glasses. Okay, okay, John. He said that he had to go back to his living quarters to get more glasses and that explained his absence and that when he got there, the door was locked and he didn't bring the key. So he had to like scale the outside of the, uh, the building that he lived to get into a second story balcony and in doing this, he cut up his hand. So that's how he explained the wounds on his hand. It all sounds extremely legit to me. It doesn't. So police were already interested in John, but they became really interested in him and started to like hone in on him when they found out that three weeks prior to Irene's murder, another woman, a 21 year old woman named Maria Guerrera. I also saw her name as America Maria Guerrera. So I'm going to call her Maria because that's where, how I saw it reported the most. Well, apparently she had been attacked while visiting another Catholic church in the area. Apparently Maria had been kneeling to pray when a man came up behind her and tried to cover her mouth with a rag. She screamed and the two struggled on the floor until she bit him in his hand and he threw her into a wall. She then got up and ran out as fast as she could, getting away from the church as quickly as possible. And there was a rumor going around that John Fight was the guilty party. John fit the description that Maria had given to the police perfectly, but when this kind of theory started floating around the church, church officials quickly shut it down, saying that there is no way one of their priests would have been involved in such a violent crime. But people at the church were like, it kind of seems weird that this guy's connected to now two women being attacked, one being murdered, and one of the priests that held a, like he led the Sunday mass after Irene's death said, and I quote, it is impossible that a priest would commit a crime like this. 
Don't speak of it. Don't even let yourselves think it. John was given a polygraph test about the murder of Irene Garza and the assault on Maria Guerrera, and I've seen conflicting information regarding this test. On one hand, it is said that he passed easily, but the man who actually gave the polygraph test said that John was very deliberate in his attempts to be vague about his involvement with both Maria and Irene. He also stated that the test implicated him in both Irene and Maria's cases, and that John was dishonest when he denied being involved. So when questioned um, by police about Maria's attack, what he did admit to was being at the church. Of course, he didn't come right out and be like, yeah, for sure. I definitely attacked Maria. No, he said that he was at that church that day, um, but that he didn't attack her. And he did have an excuse for the cut on his hand, which just happened to be in the exact spot that Maria said that she bit her attacker. Though he had, you know, excuses for everything, he was still put in a lineup and Maria did pick him out of the lineup easily as her attacker. And he ended up being charged with her attack. But when police went to arrest him for it, which I don't know why they let him leave after the lineup. I don't really know what happened there. It was a little bit vague, but they went to arrest him and he was nowhere to be found. He had left the state because he had had a quote unquote nervous breakdown from being suspected in these two crimes. Because John had left the state, the police declared that he was a fugitive on the run. And in learning this, he, he quickly came back <laughs> and he did go to trial and his trial ended in a hung jury. They just couldn't convince 12 jurors that a man of the cloth would have done the things he was being accused of. In 1962, rather than being faced with a second trial, John Fight entered a plea of no contest to a reduced charge of aggravated assault and he paid a whopping $500 fine. Because of John's association with both the assault against Maria and the murder of Irene, John ended up being sent away to a monastery called Assumption Abbey that was located in Missouri. And while in this monastery, I guess the guilt got the best of John because he confessed. He confessed the crime. He told everything that happened to one of the monks at the monastery, a man named Dale Tashany. He told Dale that he had killed one woman and had hurt another. Apparently, if you confess something to a monk, they're not required to report it. Is that true? If you know, please tell me, because that just seems insane to me. Anyways, I guess Dale said that, you know, he knew it wasn't his job to turn in John or to judge John. It was just his job to try to guide him and teach him and help him be a better person. Which I have a lot of opinions on, but we'll get to that at the end of this video. Eventually though, it was determined that the monk life, it just wasn't gonna work out for John. And he was instead transferred to Jemez Springs, New Mexico to a treatment center for troubled priests run by the servants of the Parslete. Parslete? Parcelet. When he initially went to this place, he was just there as a simple staff member, but after being there a while, he actually ended up being promoted to a supervisory position where he led like a hundred other priests that he, that he was in charge of people. He was in charge of like a hundred other priests. And while in this position, he made some questionable decisions. There was another priest at the treatment center, a man named Father James Porter, who came to the center because he was an effing child molester dude. He was known for abusing a ridiculous number of children starting in the 60s. And John Fight cleared him or pardoned him, as they say, and sent him back to another parish to be a priest again. This ended up being a pretty bad judgment call on John's part because it didn't take very long for this freaking loser to get arrested uh, for abusing 28 children. And he even confessed that he had actually abused 100 children. This guy, James Porter dude, like was just such a loser. I had to look into him after reading this. And apparently like even before joining the priesthood, he had already abused one child. And then once he got into the priesthood, he was like, oh man, I am in a great position here because I am a man of the Lord and people trust me. Apparently he was even put in charge of the altar boys, which is just like amazing. Um, but parents started to complain, right? They were like, um, this dude's being inappropriate with our kids. And did the church call the police? No, they did not. They just instead transferred him to another church where uh, the rumors and the accusations started up again. He ended up being transferred around to several different churches to like, you know, give him more chances. But eventually he ended up in a mental institution before he inevitably ended up in prison. It just seems that like everyone who knew him and everyone in the church was turning a blind eye to what he was doing, which is incredibly frustrating and disgusting considering what he was doing. And apparently this guy had even been married and had his own children who he abused as well. So 
anyway, sorry. I know that he's not part of the story t totally, but I just felt like you needed to know the type of person that John Fight was like, yeah, 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 dude, you're totally legit. You're cool. You're cool in my book. Go teach these kids. Go be in charge of altar boys while you're at it. By the 1970s, John Fight had decided that like maybe the priesthood thing wasn't really for him. Like he wasn't very good at it. And he like really enjoyed abusing women, you know, and in the position he was currently in, he wasn't making especially good judgment calls or, you know, or maybe he was. I sort of wonder if he knew what uh, James Porter was doing and was just kind of like, well, shit, man, like I'm a murderer. Who am I to judge this guy? Like go out. I, you know, I don't know. But anyways, in the seventies, John Fight left the priesthood. He ended up meeting a woman in New Mexico. The two got married and they had a couple of kids. And I sort of wonder if she knew or if she ever suspected something or if she had ever heard about him beforehand. Part of me feels like she did because like she was married to him. But at the same time, maybe she just never, maybe she had no idea. But either way, he just went on with his life like nothing had ever happened. And during all of this time, police had plenty of circumstantial evidence, but they didn't feel like they had any strong physical evidence tying John Fight to Irene Garza's murder. And since he was their only suspect, the case went cold and it stayed cold for a long time until they finally got their big break or their first big break in 2002, 40 years after Irene was murdered. That big break came for police when no other than Dale Tashney. You remember Dale Tashney, the monk that John spent some time with in Missouri the monk that he confessed uh, his crimes to. Well, this monk contacted police because he just could not live with his conscience anymore. And he called police and he told them about the John Fight confession. The only issue with Dale's account and what he told police is that John had never specifically named Irene to Dale. He had just said that he had killed a woman over Easter weekend. So when Dale called, that's the information he gave. It's just that this priest with this name said that he killed a woman over Easter weekend. But the other problem was, is that Dale called the San Antonio authorities office and not the McAllen authorities office, authorities office, police station. You know what I'm saying? And these two locations I looked up, they're three hours away. So the officer, though skeptical, did take down Dale's information and said that he would look into it. And what ended up happening, which honestly is like, what are the odds? This is like a one in a million thing. It turns out that there was a man, an officer, a detective in San Antonio that found himself looking into Irene's case, even though it wasn't in his area. It wasn't a case that he really realistically should have been looking into. He was and him and the guy who took Dale's phone call ended up connecting and they realized that they believed that the woman that Dale had been calling about was Irene Garza. Dale Tashney ended up driving from his home in Oklahoma City all the way to San Antonio so that he could tell police in person what John Fight had said to him all those years ago, what it was that was on his conscience all this, all this time that finally brought him to the point of wanting to confess to police what he knew. Dale said that John had asked Irene to come to the church rectory instead of the sanctuary and that is where he heard her confession. After the confession, he had restrained her. He believed that she had been bound and gagged and he then removed her shirt and fondled her breasts. He then moved her all tied up to the rectory basement and returned to the sanctuary to then hear confessions. The following day, Easter Sunday, he put her in a bathtub and he placed a bag over her head. He heard her saying, I can't breathe. I can't breathe, but he did not remove the bag and he left. When he came back to the rectory basement later that night, he found her dead in the bathtub. And that night he put her in the car and he drove her to the canal. He also said that John had admitted to just having the general urge to attack women in general. He said that he liked the idea of attacking them from behind because he liked the sound of the click clack of their heels hitting the ground as he attacked them, which is just like the most unsettling thing to hear. Reading that line, I was just like, Mm -mm. After giving this account, the former monk sat and cried. He could not deal with having this weight on his conscience anymore of knowing that he was involved in any sort of cover up. Shortly after this, Irene's case was just totally regenerized. The police were really going in, trying to do everything they could to look into the case again. They weren't going to just go straight to John Fight. They wanted to, you know, make sure, relook at everything, not just pigeonhole one dude. And they started interviewing old boyfriends again, old friends again. They started re-interviewing people and they eventually ended up at the same place that the original investigators had. And that was at John Fight. 
And this became particularly clear when these officers started to re-interview priests who had been working with John Fight around the time that Irene was killed. Of these priests contacted was a man named Father Joseph O'Brien, and he was a priest, duh, and he was working at the church with John Fight around the time that Irene Garza was murdered. Initially, Father Joseph O'Brien had claimed to know nothing, but he had his suspicions. He said that he had been worried about Irene, and he had been worried about the scratches on John Fight's hands, and that they looked to be clear fingernail scratches. He said he even searched the sanctuary looking for Irene after she went missing, but came up with nothing. So he was clearly pretty convinced that John had something to do with it if he's like searching the area where John worked trying to find Irene's body. But after speaking to the officers a while and being pushed a little bit, Joseph O'Brien broke and he said that he had gone to John with his suspicions a couple of months after Irene was murdered and John had confessed everything. He had told him everything. The interview with Father Joseph O'Brien was recorded and I have listened to the recording and his account of what happened matches almost perfectly with Dale Tashany's account of what happened. So that's now two two religious officials who knew what John Fight did. And instead of going to the police, they kept the information to themselves, let her case go unsolved, let her not get justice and let her family not get closure. And that makes me so mad. And if that doesn't make you mad, which it should, you're about to get even madder. After getting these stories from the men, the DA on the case, the DA at the time, refused to take it to a grand jury. He didn't think the case was strong enough, and it actually ended up taking him two years before he even put it before a grand jury to see if they thought it was strong enough to be taken to trial. He only even ended up finally taking it to a grand jury after those two years, after there was a ton of public outcry and like a lot of bad press against him. And unfortunately, once they finally brought it before a grand jury, the grand jury decided not to indict John Fight. It is theorized the reason the grand jury did not indict John is because the DA did not bring forth the key witnesses. He didn't bring Dale Tashany. He didn't bring Joseph O'Brien. He didn't even bring in John Fight himself to testify. And it's theorized, again, that the reason this is, is because the DA didn't really want to prosecute a Catholic priest. It is said that this particular DA was Catholic himself and actually went to the Sacred Heart Church, went to the Sacred Heart Church, where John Fight had worked when he was a kid growing up. But again, all of this is just opinions and has not been proven. It's not like he's going to admit to that. The DA honestly was just sort of a dick, if I'm honest with you. Like, he just looked for every excuse it seemed to not look into Irene's case and to not prosecute John Fight. He was just really dismissive. He claimed that uh, J Joseph O'Brien was suffering from dementia and that Dale Tashany wasn't even confident about where John Fight had murdered somebody or who John Fight had murdered. But I mean, John was suspected of one murder of a girl in a church where he worked. All of the facts line up pretty, pretty easily. So it's pretty clear this is the one that he was talking about. I don't know. But whatever. He said that there wasn't any real evidence and that the original investigators did like a really shitty job investigating Irene's case in the first place. When discussing the case with reporters, he said that he had looked it over and he had determined that there was nothing there. And he said, and I quote, and this is going to make you really mad. Can it be solved? Well, I guess if you believe that pigs can fly, anything can happen. And he finished this with, why would anyone be haunted by her death? She died. Her killer got away. And if that's not just a slap in the face to every single person who cared about Irene, implying that no one is haunted by her, her death or that nobody cares. By the time that he made the statement, both Irene's parents had already died. So fortunately, they didn't have to hear this and didn't have to hear her being uh, disrespected like that by somebody who's supposed to be, I don't know, working for the people. But uh, they, they had passed, so they did not have to hear that. But can you imagine if they had? Oh, my God. A man like that should not be in the position he's in. That's my opinion. For clarity, I did read that in general, he was like a pretty good DA. He did a lot for the community. I mean, he was he was a DA for a really long time. He got the job in the 80s. And I guess he did a lot of good, but like all that because he was so rude and dismissive of Irene's case that it makes me crazy. Finally, the next big break in Irene's case came in 2014 when District Court Judge Ricardo Rodriguez campaign to take this D-bag DA, by the way, the DA's name was Rene Guerrera. Well, Ricardo Rodriguez, he wanted to take Rene Guerrera's job. 
during his campaign, he actually brought Irene's case up and he said that if he was elected, he would start looking into the case, he'd get a bunch of fresh eyes on it, and he would try to finally bring justice to both Irene and her family. He actually ended up winning this election in January of 2015, and by April, Irene's case was reopened, there was a bunch of new people looking at it, they all had fresh pairs of eyes looking at Irene's case trying to determine what happened, assuming that all of these people had two eyes for a pair. In February of 2016, a now 83-year-old John Fight was arrested at his home in Scottsdale, Arizona and extradited back to Texas the following month. By this time, the man was old and in very bad health, suffering from both kidney and bladder cancer, and when he entered the court to give his plea of not guilty, he entered with the assistance of a walker. Prosecution initially asked for a bail to be set for a $750,000, which is like a lot, right? It's almost a million dollars. And of course, the defense challenged this, saying that they wanted only $100,000. They wanted this low amount due to their client, you know, old age and all of his illnesses, but the court was like, you know what? Nah, dog. And they actually set his bail at a million dollars. So they went above what the prosecution wanted. And this made me chuckle. Right before the trial was set to begin, uh, the defense actually asked for a change of venue because they felt that John Fight would not get a fair trial if it was being held in the courthouse it was, but the judge denied this. The trial began in November of 2017. Dale Tashany testified at trial, not only telling the court what John had told him he did, but he also informed the court that when John Fight was first brought to the monastery, Dale's supervisor was like, okay, Dale, this guy, he murdered a woman. So we want you to kind of suss him out, see if he'd be a good fit to be a monk. Which just illustrates that there were more people in the church who knew what John did and let it slide. Unfortunately, by the time the trial started, Joseph O'Brien, the other, the other priest that John had confessed to, he had already died. It took so long for this case to be heard that one of the key witnesses had died before trial actually happened. It also came out in the, in the trial that Irene and Maria weren't the only two women that John was a little bit weird with. A girl came forward at trial named Beatrice Garcia who claimed that shortly before Irene's murder, John Fight had pulled up to her in his car while she was standing outside and she had been like, yes, can I help you? And he was like, I would be very interested in taking you to a cemetery and taking photos of you wearing all black. Which is like, which is like weird, no? That's a weird thing for somebody to do. And John Fight clearly had a type because I'm gonna put photos up for you to see of all three of these women. They all had very similar physical features. She told him no, by the way. We don't, we don't have these photos to see because she did not take them, apparently. And this is gonna piss you off. It was no secret to the church or to specific people in positions of power in the area that John Fight was guilty of Irene's murder. Leading up to John's trial, in typical fashion, there were documents exchanged, discovery was served. If you don't know what discovery it is, it's kind of confusing, but essentially like you, the prosecution can ask the defense for documents, the defense can ask the prosecution for documents so that everybody has an even playing field and everybody has everyone's information. Well, amongst these documents was a letter, a letter dated August of 1960 that was written between two priests in the Catholic church. And it was discussing getting a certain priest who was suspected of some certain things out of hot water. I'm going to be kind of paraphrasing here. So if I'm reading something right now, it's because I'm paraphrasing what they said. In this letter, it said that the prosecution needed to be made aware of how weak their case was. It also says that this particular unnamed priest, he should be sent away as soon as possible to another part of the country and that this wouldn't seem odd to people because priests are transferred around all the time. The, the letter said that in doing this, it would kind of have sort of out of sight, out of mind situation and the suspicion on this young priest would hopefully diminish with him not being there for everybody to look at all the time. The priest who wrote this letter also said that the sheriff had told him that the longer the case stays open, the colder it'll get and the weaker it'll get. And because this sheriff was Catholic, he stand to lose just as much from this scandal. Okay. And it would be especially bad in such a heavily Catholic area. The defense tried to argue that this letter wasn't proof of any sort of cover up. It was just priests discussing the current situation going on in the church and the current case and the validity of the case. But there was one line in the letter that particularly stuck out to me. 
the sheriff concluded that the longer we had, the weaker the case gets. And he suggested all of this for going. And this hits my ear a little weird here for a couple of reasons. If there was nothing going on and there was nothing to hide and there was no cover up going on, why would the sheriff suggest this? Why would the sheriff say this? Why would he say that it's a good idea for them to put as much distance between the, the priest and the case and that the more time they have, the weaker and weaker the case will get? If John Fight was innocent, this doesn't really seem like the thought process a sheriff should have regarding the case to me. And additionally, isn't the sheriff's interest supposed to be in solving Irene's murder? Why is he even talking to the church? Why is he even advising them on what to do, right? Why is this sheriff advising the church and potentially helping the police's number one murder suspect? This all seems very odd to me. So this is all sketchy, right? And the idea of this cover-up is strengthened even more by the testimony given by a member of the press who came forward during John Fight's trial, who said that he was present during an off the record meeting between the prosecution and priest ETC ETC. In this meeting, apparently it was discussed that both the authorities and the church know that John Fight is guilty of Irene's murder. So what they decided to do is in exchange for a plea of no contest in the assault of Maria Guerrero, which is easily proven that he did, they would not prosecute him for the murder of Irene Garza, which there was less evidence to prove he did, and instead handle it internally and send him away to a place where they send troubled priests. So that's weird, right? <laughs> like, that's weird? Um, and additionally, oh, I forgot, I forgot, there was one more thing in the letter also. The letter also stated that if they didn't get the John Fight situation under control, it would not only have issues for the church, but it could also jeopardize the upcoming presidential election of John F. Kennedy, because John F. Kennedy was famously Catholic. So this went like, this went big. They had a big agenda, the church did. They considered that there would be, and I quote, political implications to this that could make this a juicy scandal for the opposition to Kennedy. The issue here, among many, is that this entity is self-governed. So they take it upon themselves to try to help or cure or solve the problems with these monsters internally. And to me, that is ridiculous. It's just like the freaking case um, of Vanessa Guillen, where it's similar within the, the government, where it's self-governed and they deal with their things internally. I disagree with this wholeheartedly. I, I don't think it should be like that. How all of these people who knew what happened and weren't arrested for being involved in the cover-up, for aiding and abetting, I will never understand. They should be in jail. It's outrageous and there shouldn't be any sort of religious protection here. The fuck? That doesn't make any sense to me. It just makes me so mad because John knew that he was protected by the church, the police, and the seal of confession. But who was protecting Irene here? In December of 2017, 57 years after the crime took place, John Fight was finally found guilty of the murder of 25-year-old Irene Garza. During the punishment phase, the defense had the audacity to ask for only probation due to John Fight's, you know, horrible health and also the fact that he had no felony convictions from the time that Irene was killed on, which <laughs> maybe they didn't catch him because he was good at hiding and people were good at covering him up, but that's just my opinion. The prosecution asked for a very dramatic sentence. They wanted 57 years, one year per year that had passed since Irene had been killed. The jury decided to veto both of their, their suggestions and they instead went with a sentence of life in prison. And he would not be eligible for parole until 2028 when he is 95 years old, which I think is just beautiful. John didn't make it that long though. Already suffering from multiple cancers, he died in the hospital after spending just over two years in prison. He died of natural causes on February 12th, 2020, so just over a year now. He just died after spending only two years in prison. And that, my friends, is the story of the horrible murder of Irene Garza. And I ask you now, as always, what do you think? I think it's a horribly sad case. I think it's incredibly upsetting and a little maddening, actually. She was just such a beautiful person, not just because she was physically beautiful. She was a beauty queen, but she was also like a beautiful person inside. She decided with her life, she wanted to help people. She wanted to give back to the community that she had been part of and like be a teacher for, you know, kids who had a less than ideal um, home situation. It's just, 
she was, it's just very upsetting because she seemed like such a good person and she just wanted to go to church, dude. She just wanted to go to the place where she felt home and safe and secure. And she wanted to confess to her priest, someone who's supposed to teach her and guide her and respect her and someone that she trusted. And he broke that trust. He stole her life and he stole her from everyone who loved her. And that's so upsetting because it's like, that's forever. She's gone forever. She'll never exist again, you know? And I know that's such an obvious statement, but I wonder if people really think about that. Like, that's it. That's it. She's gone. That's it. And I can't stop thinking about the freaking photo slide viewer. Like, why did he admit to, belong, to, to owning that? And why was it there? Like, it wasn't like the police were onto him already and they came to him and were like, hey, is this yours? No, he saw the newspaper and was like, yo, that's mine. And it's so odd to me and I don't understand why he did it. I did see a theory somewhere. I can't remember where I saw it, but I saw somebody say that they thought that maybe he was trying to like poke and prod and intimidate the police by being like, yeah, it's mine. Now what are you going to do? But who knows? I have no idea. It's just one of those things that like goes around in my head and that I can't make any sense of. This case just makes me so mad, dude. The day that I finished researching it, like fully got my notes all together, I was just like pissed. I went to my husband and I like bitched about it for a while, even though like it's not his interest. It's just so upsetting. And it's very upsetting that her parents never got to know what happened to her and that they died with no answers. I can imagine though, that it would be really difficult for them to one, suspect their priest, but two, to actually know that he did it, that would probably be a lot to handle. And I can't imagine how hard that would be. But either way, they deserved those answers and they never got them. And that's fucked up, man. I'm just glad he got arrested, to be honest. I mean, that's a very obvious statement also, but I'm glad he got arrested. And I feel like it's just so fucked up how much time he got out free because did he get arrested? Did they finally get justice? I guess like he did, but he only served two years and then died. That's it. And to me, that doesn't really feel like justice. And straight up, Every church official, every member of law enforcement who knew what he did and said nothing and tried to cover it up and tried to push it under the rug, they should all be in jail. Like for sure. There's no reason why they shouldn't be. It doesn't make any sense to me. I do not believe in the protection from the seal of confession. That's bullshit. That's bullshit. It should not exist. It no. When it comes to murder, when it comes to anything, they should not, there's no reason for there to be a protection there. I, I just, I don't get it. I'm sorry. But anyways, guys, that completes this video. I hope that it was interesting and informative and gave you every bit of information you would want when looking into this case. Priscilla, I hope this met your expectations when you asked for it. If my energy seemed low, I'm so sorry. I do not feel well today. My throat hurts and I'm a little like, Ugh, but I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> of course, I also want to thank you for like being here and hanging out and remembering Irene with me today because I do think that she is worth remembering. And I really hope that you enjoyed watching it because I always want you to enjoy what I'm putting out into the world. Please let me know of any cases you would like to see me cover down below in the comments, because as you see, if you suggest it, I add it to my list and I look into it. And eventually I hope to get to all of your cases. I mean, I got nothing but time, hopefully. So, and I, and I know, and I just, and I just know you're filled with good ideas and good taste. Otherwise you would not be here. Of course, please make sure to join the Brat Pack by subscribing and ringing the bell because I put out a new morbid makeup video every single week and I would love to hang out with you. And if you'd like to follow me on my other social media, I have both Instagram and Twitter. They're both Brat or Seen like my name's Akir and I am on there often. And with all of that said, I just want to thank you for being here when you could literally be anywhere else in the world. That's tight. You're tight. And I hope to see you in my next video.